Hi students, welcome to HSC Biology and Module 6, Genetic Change. This is video number 14 and it's the first in the final section on genetic change where we start to look at some of these biotechnologies and applications of genetic change uh, in some specific detail. This is the introduction to this final section and we've just called it Inducing Genetic Change. What we have to do is investigate the uses and advantages of current genetic technologies that induce genetic change. So obviously that's a very broad area and it's something that we're going to be covering in more specific detail in subsequent videos as we look at some of these techniques. But let's just have a bit of an overview in this video just to give you a, a list of some of the things that are to come and a very brief um, introduction to some of these very specific uh, and very effective genetic change techniques. We want you to describe current genetic technologies that can induce genetic change. In fact, I hope you can already do that. I hope you can already talk about the application of CRISPR, for example. Um, you should be able to explain the use of current genetic technologies and how they induce genetic change. Again, CRISPR is a great example of that. But what we want to try and do is to build up a number of different types of technologies, a number of ways in which we can change um, the genetic information in a particular individual and see how that plays out in subsequent generations. So let's have a look at some of these techniques. Probably the first thing that's worth doing is reviewing the key players that we've really had a look at both through the heredity um, topic and into this one on genetic change. So we looked at Mendel, we know that he was about the P's and the laws of inheritance. Consistent experiments, those very reliable experiments where he used lots and lots of repetition, large sample sizes, very good control. So he was exercising both validity and reliability in his results, able to determine some very simple ratios that have become known as the Mendelian ratios for how traits can be passed on from one generation to another and countering the old belief of some sort of blending of the genes between the parents. Instead, he talked about particulates, um, specific things that keep their character as they pass from one generation to the other. We subsequently know um, that not all of Mendel's conclusions were correct, but he was substantially correct, and the things that he wasn't correct about are things he could have had no knowledge of. We've also looked at Charles Darwin and his theory of evolution through natural selection. And when we talked about natural selection, we talked about three key areas. We talked about variation, a selecting agent, and reproduction. And that's where this is all fitted in very, very nicely because variation can be caused by a number of different types of things as simple as sexual reproduction, which blends different characters together, um, to mutation, which specifically introduces some of those new combinations uh, into the gene pool. And the process of natural selection that actually create um, natural selecting agents, uh, whatever they may be, aspects of the environment, um, selective choice on the parts of potential mates um, to favour certain characters and, and hence certain genes over others. And his work's been so important because we've also understood that we can do that in an artificial way. We can actually look at the specific traits that are important to us uh, as humans, as farmers, as consumers, and um, as pet owners, and to say, these are the traits we want to favor. These are the ones that we specifically want to select. And so we've moved from Darwin's idea of natural selection through to artificial selection, something slightly different um, that still relies upon those very important principles. And in this topic, we've added, I guess, more specifically, that um, narrower focus on the structure of DNA, particularly the DNA code, the fact that it's based on a very simple four-letter alphabet, and those four letters code uh, for amino acids that produce proteins, and those proteins have such a diverse range of function in different organisms. So we need to keep all of these key players in mind as we think about some of the implications and the ways in which we have tried to manipulate and change populations over time. So what then do we say when we talk about genetic change? Well, what we're trying to do is to control inherited characteristics, which we've done so for years and years. So this dates back to the first domestication, the first time we actually tried to um, 
corner wild animals and bring them over to our side to be able to keep them in an area where we could um, more easily have access to them, whether that was uh, simply building um, fish traps or dams in a form of aquaculture, whether it was trying to tame uh, the, the, the less aggressive wolves to, to be companions. Whatever that was, were aspects of artificial selection, ways in which we had tried to override some of those natural pressures, or in fact, perhaps just to add another natural pressure, humans, after all, are part of um, life on Earth. And therefore, we have created some of our own pressures um, or selecting agents that have acted on um, populations of organisms over time. And it's those favoured characteristics which we've tried to continue to breed in generation after generation so that we have seen some changes um, that have occurred. We now know too that we, instead of using that kind of very general haphazard response of just putting a male and a female with desired traits together and see what happens, now we've got to an understanding, um, thanks to all of the work that's been done previously uh, on the the um, structure of DNA and the human genome um, and the genome of many other organisms that we can start now playing around with DNA itself, actually manipulating, cutting, um, pasting, sticking different lengths in, moving uh, genes from one organism to a completely different type of organism to create a genetically modified or transgenic organism. All of these things are now possible and they're part of um, the strategies that we have in place to try and, and look at um, beneficial traits, minimizing disease and all of those sorts of things. So artificial selection then is, I uh, guess, the, one of the first areas that we're going to look in. And we're particularly going to look at areas uh, around pollination and insemination as specific ways that started us down this artificial selection track. The genetic composition of many plants and animal populations have been artificially and probably irreversibly changed as a consequence of the development of reproductive technologies and even an understanding of how um, offspring can um, display uh, the sorts of traits that they have obtained from their parents. We have talked a little bit about selective breeding and domestication, especially hybridization, which works extremely well with plants. And now the deliberate mating of individuals with desired characteristics is what we want to look at in this first little section. Um, that, that'll be the first few videos in this final section um, to look at artificial pollination in, in flowering plants and artificial insemination for a, a number of different types of animals. What you want to do is to go through this list, pick out some of the things that you're already aware of. You may already know something about genetic engineering and recombinant DNA, genetically modified organisms would fit in here, for example. Um, CRISPR-Cas9, which is something we've talked about quite a lot in class, that, that little book's fantastic. Um, and some of the other things that we've alluded to, but which will expand, uh, include things like gene clone and even whole animal cloning and we have again talked a little bit about that but we'll visit that in a bit more detail the polymerized chain reaction or PCR is very important as well and so many other things that are part of our understanding a part of our current genetic technologies that can change DNA um, and provide all sorts of different solutions to um, preferred crops and livestock and um, freedom or resistance to disease. But we're gonna look at each of these in a little bit more detail in upcoming videos. Thanks for watching.